Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and to delve into the challenges and impact each technology has in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. The BIS monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Reliance on BIS system alone for intraoperative anesthetic management is not recommended. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA-cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise cited. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers received funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for the speaking engagement. For this segment of the series, a discussion on anesthesia and the brain, we will discuss how we are currently monitoring the brain during surgery. To help provide insight into this topic is Dr. Bob Thiele, Assistant Professor and Co-Director Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Program at University of Virginia. When I talk about monitoring, and I do I talk about monitoring, not just process CEG. I'm interested in all monitoring, but I think always the first place to start is the ASA basic anesthetic monitoring standards, which really were developed in 1986 and have been um, continuously uh, adapted over the last really 35 years. So if we look at the ASA standard monitors, um, We've got a couple of things that we use for every anesthetic case, and a lot of these are applicable to the intensive care unit as well, but not all of them. So for oxygenation, we measure oxygen delivery with FiO2, and we measure oxygen in hemoglobin with our pulse oximeter. Ventilation, we use entitled CO2. Hemodynamics, we have three different measures. We measure heart rate, blood pressure, and then we also continuously monitor the EKG. We measure body temperature in all patients. So with anesthesia, the question is, well, what's missing out of this? And sort of the answer is maybe the brain. Like why are people actually having anesthesia? It's to become unconscious and unresponsive. And we don't actually always monitor that or it's not considered a standard monitor, which is sort of an interesting, I think, omission. And when this was developed in 1986, there was really no way for practicing anesthesiologists or CRNAs or ICU nurses to realistically monitor the brain because all you had was uh, EEG used by a neurologist. But now we have process EEG and that's, that's changed things. So backing up and thinking about anesthesia, like how do we traditionally ensure that someone is actually anesthetized? And we, when we talk about what anesthesia is, we say really three things, amnesia, lack of memory, unconsciousness, they're not going to experience the event, and then immobility. And the majority of patients in the United States that are anesthetized are based on volatile anesthetic agents. And so this is just some imagery taken from Miller, one of the standard anesthesia textbooks that kind of describes the way we are taught about how volatile anesthetic agents work, which, and how we can monitor them or their um, effect on our patients. And so on the right here, that green line is really, what it says is that if you use one MAC of volatile anesthetic agent, 50% of your patients will not move after a surgical stimulus. And that's actually quite a bit higher than the amount of anesthesia required to make sure that 50% of patients are unconscious, which is more than is required to make sure that 50% of patients don't remember anything. But those three lines are different things and they are mediated by different processes. So the, the anesthetic targets to cause amnesia are not the same as unconsciousness, which are not the same as immobility. And this is an idealized figure. The reality is more messy than that. And an important question is, do these lines ever overlap? Is it possible to be immobile but conscious. Uh, and then when you throw on top of that neuromuscular blockade, you can no longer use immobility to ensure that your patient is unconscious. And so this is just some language taken from, you know, our sort of classic anesthesia text, basically describing that it's a little bit more complicated than that picture suggests. 
Um, and sort of the fundamental problem with the Mac concept is that it's based on mobility, which is a spinal reflex primarily and not consciousness. So if you look at actual studies of awareness in adult patients, it's clear that to me that what we're doing isn't working perfectly. Either the immobility paradigm is not always true, or if we're paralyzed in our patients, we can't rely on it because they're not gonna move, they're paralyzed. So how do you know they're not actually experiencing any of the procedure? So from a 30,000 point, 30,000 foot view, the big question I think is why don't we routinely monitor the brain? Why is it not an ASA standard monitor? And I think the answer is that because what we were taught is that with the use of volatile anesthetic agents, we don't need to. And so that's that based on the immobility paradigm, which raises a question, A, why are we using volatile anesthetic agents instead of intravenous agents, and we'll get into that later. And two, is the immobility paradigm really actually true? It certainly is irrelevant in a patient that's paralyzed. So if intraoperative awareness is a problem, which it is, um, I love this Sun Tzu quote, know thy enemy, um, and that's, I paraphrase it, but if you're trying to solve a problem, you have to really understand it. And the human brain's not a problem, but consciousness under anesthesia or during surgery is a problem. And it's intimidating at first to think, how am I gonna solve this problem? I mean, the human brain truly is probably the most complex entity in the known universe. We, we don't even, we're not even scratching the surface in terms of fully understanding it. So is it possible to really tackle this problem with, that, with incomplete understanding of how the brain works? And that gets into the idea of like a reductionist approach. But the answer is yes, we probably can. And this is where electroencephalography comes in. The idea here is that we can get important physiologic information from the brain without completely understanding it. And what EEG does is it's analogous to EKG. It's measuring voltage difference between two different points on the scalp which gives you some information about electrical activity occurring in the brain. And the classic example in my mind of how EEG can give you useful information, even though you don't fully understand what's happening is in seizures. And we see that in the intensive care unit. Um, clinical seizures are easy to detect because you can, see, you, can, you can observe seizures visually. But 8% of non-responsive ICU patients are having subclinical seizures, which means they have seizure activity in the brain, but it doesn't manifest as any physical movement. And that seizure activity is very easy to detect on EEG. And even if we don't understand the etiology of that with EEG, you can detect somebody having a seizure. Please tune in next week for a new segment from this series wherever you find your podcast. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. Thank you for listening.